So yeah, um, yes, it is likely the earliest of the Gospels. We're going to spend some time with that tonight. Um, the ending is is uh, challenging at best. No Christmas story. The Easter story seems to kind of break off in the middle. Um, and we have kind of the, the high points of baptism, figuration, and... Uh, resurrection or crucifixion and resurrection is kind of the three pieces of the frame that everything hangs from. Anything else kind of come to mind with Mark's gospel? And that's Lord, okay if there's nothing else that comes to mind. We are here to learn. So, um, so yeah, um, Mark is a fascinating book to study, and it is fascinating to see what people have had to say about Mark over the years. Um, most of church history was not very kind to Mark. Um, one of the earliest comments we have about Mark comes from Eusebius. He was a church historian who wrote um, in the mid-fourth century, and he said that uh, he passed down the tradition that Mark was Peter's interpreter. So he accompanied Peter to Rome because Peter didn't speak Latin. So Mark went with him. And as Peter kind of reminisced about all the stuff he knew about Jesus, Mark just wrote it down. So everything is just kind of thrown together in no particular order. Um, so Eusebius says, yeah, he's got some good information, but he really just kind of throws it together. Um, and that's like the nicest thing people have to say about Mark. Um, a couple generations later, later St. Augustine uh, described Mark as a follower. He said Mark was a lackey. He was a digester of Matthew. So Augustine said, you know, what was really going on was that Matthew wrote this wonderful account of Jesus' life, and for some reason, Mark decided to go through and edit out a bunch of stuff and call it his own book. And that that was kind of the view that prevailed for a long time. In fact, we don't have any commentaries on Mark that are earlier than the Middle Ages. So Mark was written in the first century, and it's probably the 10th or 11th century before we have any commentary on it, before anybody wrote down kind of this is what we think about Mark. So a thousand years of silence. Um, that's pretty profound. We have commentaries on every other book from that period. Um, and it's not to say that nothing was written as, as you know, stuff can get lost, especially a manuscript over the course of a thousand years. But we do have copies of other uh, commentaries on other books, nothing on Mark for a thousand years. So that kind of tells you the, the interest level in Mark's gospel for a long time. Um, and then we get to the 19th century. By the 19th century, you know, the Enlightenment's been going on. Um, well, the Renaissance happened and the Reformation happened and the Enlightenment happened. And there are all these scholars in Europe who are saying, well, you know, we've been studying all of these other ancient texts. You know, we've been reading Greek and Roman literature and we have all these wonderful literary techniques. What, what if we were to take those techniques and apply them to the Bible? You know, kind of asking what was going on when this happened. Why would they want to write this particular thing this way? That'll help us understand it better. Well, one of the things that they were trying to get a better understanding of, and people have been aware of this issue for a thousand years at least, but it's what they called the synoptic problem. And when we talk about the synoptic gospels, it's from words that mean, you know, seeing something together. We're talking about Matthew, Mark, and Luke. Um, the synoptic problem is that Matthew, Mark, and Luke are a little bit too much alike to have been written by three people in three separate places without there being some kind of common factor. Um, and it's not just that they are all telling the story of Jesus. Yeah, you expect some overlap there. But um, a lot of the stuff they have is word for word verbatim. Stuff is exactly identical. And the stuff that's identical is not all um, 
stuff that is passed along well through oral tradition. It's not uh, not all sayings or um, stories or parables, that sort of thing. It's accounts of events. And it's that sort of thing where they say, you know, eyewitnesses tend to be unreliable. Several people can see the same thing happen and they'll describe it different ways. Matthew, Mark, and Luke are describing the exact same stuff in the exact same words. That's a little bizarre. Um, and so for a long time, people thought, well, you know, Matthew was first and Mark, for whatever reason, cut a bunch of stuff out. But what they, what the scholars in the 19th century started to notice was that Matthew and Luke, all the stuff that the three of them have in common, it's stuff that is in Mark. Mark begins with John the Baptist and Mark ends with the empty tomb. Between those two parts of the story of Jesus' life, these three books follow pretty much the same order of things. But prior to John the Baptist, Matthew and Luke <laughs> have some very different stuff. Um, you know, the Christmas story in Matthew, they're already in Bethlehem and they are forced to leave because Herod is coming to kill people. And so they go to Egypt and then they end up in Nazareth because it's safer. Luke, they're in Nazareth. They have to go to Bethlehem for the census. And then getting to Nazareth is simple. They're just going home. The resurrection accounts are, are pretty different. In Matthew, Jesus is up on the Mount of Olives and he is talking about going out and making disciples of all nations. In Luke, he's in the temple and he says, you're going to wait for the Holy Spirit. But so Mark seems to be, is almost like a common factor. So like the stuff that Mark has is kind of the bookends of where Matthew and Luke kind of agree on a lot of stuff. Um, so that's kind of interesting. The other thing to think about is if Mark started with, say, Matthew, why on earth would he cut out things like the Lord's Prayer? A lot of people already knew the Lord's Prayer. Why on earth would he leave that out? Why would he leave out the Sermon on the Mount, Luke and uh, Matthew both have versions of it. Why would he leave out the Beatitudes? Um, so that's, that's kind of bizarre that we have all these questions about why is some stuff so much the same and other stuff is so wildly different. Um, and sometimes people just assume that, well, you know, Mark just for whatever reason decided he wanted to cut a bunch of stuff out. But the scholars in the 19th century said that that doesn't make any sense. What makes a lot more sense is that Mark was first and Matthew and Luke added other stuff on. So uh, this is called the, the two source hypothesis, um, even though it actually talks about four different sources, but they already had a four source, hy source hypothesis for the, uh, the Old Testament. So they called it the two source, but anyway, the two sources are Mark, so they're saying Matthew and Luke both started with a copy of Mark. They had an actual written document in front of them. That was the gospel according to Mark. But then there's also a bunch of stuff that Matthew and Luke have that Mark doesn't have. And most of that is uh, sayings of Jesus or parables. So they're going, okay, and some of that stuff is verbatim the same. So this is even more bizarre. So what people, what the scholars have theorized is that Mark was first. Matthew and Luke each had a copy of that. Matthew and Luke also each had a copy of some other, some other source. Uh, it has things like the Lord's Prayer, the Beatitudes, the Sermon on the Mount, um, and they're the same. So they have dubbed this thing Q, which is an abbreviation for the German Quelle, which means a source. And so that was a, a theory that people went, okay, you know, that makes a lot of sense. How come we've never found a copy of Q? Well, first of all, manuscripts can get lost or destroyed. So we don't know why we've never found it. Maybe it's circulated as, as an oral collection of sayings. But what we did find in sometime in the 20th century, 
was a book called the Gospel of Thomas. Has anyone heard of the Gospel of Thomas? I see, some, I see one hand up. So the Gospel of Thomas is, it is not this Q source, this thing we think Matthew and Luke used, but it is the same type of thing as we think that was. Thomas starts off by saying, this is the Gospel of Thomas, the secret hidden wisdom of Jesus. And then it goes on page after page. Jesus said, blah, blah, blah. Jesus said, blah, blah, blah. So we know that there were documents that were just collection Jesus saves, which is what we think this Q thing was. And so um, then in addition to that, Matthew had some of his own stuff and Luke had some of his own stuff. But Mark seems to be the first. That is the only, that is the only thing that makes the most sense, I should say, uh, to explain why we have some stuff that's exactly the same across the gospel. So all of the people who were kind of putting down Mark and, you know, he's not really that great, we're pretty sure he was actually good enough that Matthew and Luke both said, I'm going to use this as the basis for my account of Jesus' life. So um, Mark is, is profoundly important, if for no other reason than he spurred these other two people to go ahead and, and write what they wrote. Um, and I will just mention that we believe Mark was first Scholars think it was written somewhere in the Roman Empire, probably not in Palestine, just based on the, the language and the descriptions of things, in around the year 70, because we think Matthew and Luke were around the year 80, so Mark had to be earlier, and he may or may not be talking about the temple being destroyed, which happened in 70. So Mark, Mark is more than likely our first gospel. Um, and interestingly enough, not only was he first, but the way Mark tells the story uh, is really, I think, fascinating and, and very compelling. Um, so all the people who said, oh, you know, he just kind of threw stuff together in a jumble. I feel like maybe they didn't read very carefully. Um, and over the coming weeks, I will make that case to you. So uh, let me stop there. Questions, comments, concerns, thoughts? In the last week in, in Acts, there was a reference to a Mark. I can't remember. Was it a John Mark or Peter Mark or something yes. like that? Would that? Could that be this Mark or not? Can I ask you to hold that question for approximately 30 seconds? Sure. Okay. Um, so, yeah. We believe Mark is the first gospel. Um, so who is Mark? Um, the traditional answer, uh, the one that the church historian Eusebius gave was that he was a guy who went with Peter to Rome and as Peter reminisced about his time with Jesus, Mark just kind of went, oh, that's a good one. I'm going to write that down too. And it seems to be kind of just thrown together. Uh, a huge majority of his sentences just start with the word and, and then this happened and then that happened and then Jesus did this. And then Jesus said that. So you could kind of get the impression that he took a bunch of stuff and just kind of put it down on paper in the order that he heard it. Um, like I said, in the weeks to come, I, I guarantee I will disabuse you of that notion. And yes, that's a bold statement, but I am confident in that. So, um, so, so tradition says, yes, he's, he's this guy who went with Peter and ended up in Rome uh, hanging out with Peter. There's other traditions about him being in uh, Alexandria in Egypt, uh, um, but Rome is one of the more popular places. Um, early on, people said, well, we have this thing. We think it was written by a guy named Mark. Do we know anybody named Mark? Well, in fact, yes. Yes, they do know someone named Mark. Uh, let's go to our texts. Uh, Nancy, will you share with us Colossians 4.10? And Jim, will you share with us 2 Timothy 4.11? And Kim, I'll ask you to share Philemon 23 and 24. Sure, you gave me the one with the unpronounceable name. Yes, ma'am. Aristochus, my fellow prisoner, greets you with Mark, 
the cousin of Barnabas, about whom you received instructions, if he comes to you, welcome him. So we've got Mark as the cousin of Barnabas. We know who Barnabas is. He's the guy who travels with Paul for a while. And we'll come back to that, and that will answer Tom's question. Um, okay, so we have Mark here in one of Paul's letters. Uh, what about in 2 Timothy? Give them these instructions and these teachings. Or Timothy? No, Timothy. Second Timothy. Oh, 4. sorry. Yeah. Here it is. Second Timothy. Uh, Four eleven. Yes. Four eleven. Second Timothy. Oh. Only Luke is with me. Get Mark and bring him with you, for he is useful to me for, for ministry. Sorry so about that. Paul writing, and you know, he says, Luke is with me. That makes sense based on what we know from Acts. Um, but he says, go and get Mark and bring him. I like Mark. He's, he's good. He's helpful. So if Mark is hanging out with Paul, then he probably knows a lot of Jesus stuff. That, that might make sense. What do you find out in uh, five? <laughs> okay. Epaphras, my fellow prisoner in Christ Jesus, sends greetings to you, and so do Mark, Aristarchus, yep. Demas, and Luke, my fellow workers. So here we've got Aristarchus again and Luke and Mark. So all these guys hanging to get out together with Paul. So we have a Mark who knows a lot of other people who write a lot of New Testament stuff. Maybe, maybe there's something there. Um, but as Tom pointed out, we also have another guy named Mark. In fact, Tom, let me ask you to share with us uh, those two verses out of Acts 12. And uh, Shirley, if you could share with us um, out of Acts 15. Right, I'm getting there. X twelve twelve. Aware of his situation, he went to the home of Mary, the mother of John Mark, where many people had gathered and were praying. Were praying. So Paul knows of this woman named Mary, who can, or no, Peter. This is Peter delivered from prison. Peter is sprung from prison and he goes, well, I'm going to go to Mary's house. He goes to Mary's house and her son is there, her son named John, but people also call him Mark. So we have a guy hanging out with Peter, um, kind of right in the thick of the action. Fascinating. What do we find out a little later there, Tom? Barnabas and Saul finished their mission and returned from Jerusalem, taking John Mark with them. So not only has he hung out with Peter, but now Paul and Barnabas, who in other places is called his cousin, take him to Jerusalem. So he goes and hangs out with the other big time church people. Okay, that, that could make some sense. Uh, what happens to Mark in chapter 15, Shirley? Is that the Tom and Shirley or the other Shirley? Tom and Shirley. Okay. You go ahead. It's fifteen thirty-seven. Okay. Barnabas wanted to take John Mark with them, but Paul did not think it was right to take him because he had not stayed with them to the end of their mission, but had turned back and left them in. Pamphylia. So now Barnabas takes Mark off and he's no longer with Paul. So if he's no longer with Paul, he could eventually wind up with Peter. So we do have some people named Mark that are kind of mentioned in passing who could fit the bill. 
Um, but we also think that the book was written quite a bit later than, than this, between the years 70 and 80. So if this is indeed the same Mark, he is an old, old dude by the time he gets around to writing this book. We're not saying it couldn't happen. It's just maybe not so likely. Um, so we have some people named Mark. However, if we turn to Mark's gospel, uh, we find that like all of the gospels, it's anonymous. Um, people attach the name Mark to it early on, but there is nothing in the text that tells us who wrote it. I mean, Paul writes his letters, he says, hi, I'm Paul, I'm here to tell you some stuff. Um, in Revelation, the guy says, my, my name is John, and I had a vision, I'm going to tell you about it. Um, the other epistles uh, from Peter and so on, they, they all have that. Matthew, we, we feel pretty confident in saying, you know, he was probably with a group of people who had just been thrown out of the synagogue, um, so we can, it's, it's anonymous. We don't know if it was the Matthew who followed Jesus, but we kind of understand what his context is. Uh, Luke is very passionate about the mission to the Gentiles and acts of mercy. So we kind of get a little sense of where he's coming from. John, everything is black and white. In Matthew, Mark, and Luke, Jesus says the greatest commandment, love God and love neighbor. In John, Jesus says, this is the way people will know if you're my disciples, if you love each other. So we think John is writing in a community that is kind of having to close ranks and turn into one another uh, because they're being persecuted. So we have a sense of what he's doing. Mark gives us very little. The only thing we know about Mark is he thinks Jesus is important. And because of the way he tells the story, which we'll get into later, he thinks it is important for us to respond to the story of Jesus with the way we live. So we don't know what was going on in Mark's community. Who is this guy? Why are these things important? There's very little for us to go on. Um, so we don't have a lot of insight uh, in that department. Let me stop there. Questions, thoughts, comments? Okay, so we've talked about uh, who is Mark, uh, who, what, what is Mark? Let's turn to the game itself. Uh, Robin, will you share with us the, what a lot of people believe is actually written as the title, but we'd have it as chapter one, verse one. Uh, can you share with us chapter one, verse one of Mark's gospel? The beginning of the gospel of Jesus Christ, the son of God. Yep. This is the beginning of the gospel of Jesus Christ, the Son of God. Uh, in your translation, it may say the beginning of the good news. And if it says that, there's probably a footnote that says, or gospel. Um, it is the only one of our accounts of Jesus' life that actually says, this is a gospel. Um, it's the only one that calls itself that. Um, so what is a gospel? It comes from the Greek term euangelion, and if we have any linguists among us, if you can tell me how the word euangelion uh, that has vowels at the beginning, a G in the middle, and no S and no P becomes the word gospel in English, I would love to know. Um, but it, like so many other great Greek words, is a compound word. It has the prefix eu, uh, which is generally for something that is good or true, um, like a euphemism, famy is to speak. So a euphemism is a good way of saying a bad thing. For instance, nobody dies, people pass on. Um, so it is good. And angelos uh, means a messenger. So our word angel, a messenger from God comes from that word. So it is, it is a good announcement. This was not a word that the gospel writers invented. It was a term used in Greek, usually to describe uh, the public pronouncement of a significant event. Um, people would come and they would announce, I have gospel from the king. He's just won a battle. I have gospel from the emperor. He has a child, so someone can continue to lord over us. Um, 
So by, by taking this word that means an official notice, an official public proclamation of something important and good, and Mark saying, that's what this book is. It is an official public pronouncement of something that is very, very good. Um, he is making a bold statement. Mark starts his book with this word, and he loves to use it. So I think by looking at the various ways he use it, uses it, we can really understand what the gospel means to uh, Mark and why that's important. So let's let's take a look at the examples there of um, places where he uses the term gospel or good news. Um, we just heard chapter one, verse one. Um, what what do we think it means there? So the good news would be what if that was the only thing we had to go on? And it's chapter one, verse one, as he opens this book. What would how would we define good news if that was the only thing we had to go on? Message from Jesus. A message from Jesus, or a message about Jesus. I have the um, the teaching Bible here, and this is what it says. And it usually it does use the word in in Galia, or how you said that. Mm -hmm. And it says that one, it is used as a fulfillment of God's promises to Israel about forgiveness and new life through the Messiah. And two, it's an extended account of Jesus' teaching and healing ministry. Right. So, um, you know good news especially used right here at the beginning this whole book it's the story of what jesus does the story about jesus is gospel it's good news so we have that but then he uses it a little differently a little further down um robin will you share with us a little further down in chapter one uh verses 14 and 15. Um, now, after John was arrested, Jesus came into Galilee, proclaiming the gospel of God and saying, <clears throat> the time is fulfilled and the kingdom of God is at hand. Repent and believe in the gospel. So if that was all we had to go on, he actually says he's proclaiming the gospel. And these are the words he uses. What is he talking about when he says this is the gospel? The truth. Well, in mine, in mine, this is the new international version, and it actually does not use gospel. It says proclaiming the good news of God. Right. And and he says what the good news is: the time is fulfilled; the kingdom of God has come near. <coughs> so, gospel is the account of Jesus. Gospel is also. The arrival of God's kingdom in what Jesus does. So it's the story of Jesus. It's God's kingdom arriving in Jesus. Um, let's keep going. I promise all of these will make sense. Uh, Lindsay, will you share with us uh, uh, Mark chapter 8, 34 and 35? Just a disclaimer, it's pretty close, but I have not been to Bible study in a long time, so I'm using my son's Veggie Tales Bible, but it is, it is still like, I, as we've been reading the text, it's been okay, so we'll just kind of have to, uh, <laughs> my husband is laughing at me. Okay, Jesus called the crowd to him along with his disciples. He said, if anyone wants to come after me, he must say no to himself. He must pick up his cross and follow me. If he wants to save his life, he will lose it. But if he loses his life for me and for the good news, he will save it. Close? Yes. <laughs> okay. So, so what is Jesus talking about here when he's talking about gospel or good news? So he will be saved if... 
whoever loses his life for Jesus will be will be saved. Right. Kind of like discipleship, right? Too. A absolutely like discipleship. The way of the cross. Jesus says, if you want to follow me, my way is the way of the cross. This is the good news. The way of the cross is good news. And if you want to, you know, be saved, you need to lose your life for the sake of the gospel. So there is definitely something going on here with good news being linked to Jesus' death. Again, maybe not what we would think of as good news right away. So the story of Jesus, God's kingdom arriving in Jesus, Jesus dying, all of these things are gospel. Um, are we noticing a common thread yet? That's okay. We have a few more to get through. We, we, will, get, we will get there. Uh, Carol, will you share with us, please, uh, out of chapter 10, verses 28 through 30? Peter began to say to him, look, we have left everything and followed you. Jesus said, truly, I tell you, there is no one who has left house or brothers or sisters or mother or father or children or fields for my sake and for the sake of the good news. Who will not receive a hundredfold now in this age? Houses, brothers and sisters, mothers and children and fields with persecutions and in the age to come eternal life so leaving for the sake of the good news again following jesus um going with him walking away there's a sense of of loss but there's the invitation to follow jesus and that is good news too. So Jesus inviting us is good news. Um, we'll, we'll keep going and then we'll come back and, and sum up. Uh, chapter 13. Jack, will you share with us uh, 13, uh, 9 and 10, please? As for yourselves, beware for they will hand you over to councils and you will be beaten in synagogues and you will stand before government, governors and kings because of me as a testimony to them. And the good news must first be proclaimed to all nations. So the good news needs is a message that needs to be shared. It is something Thing that is that is active it is something that's going to have an impact make a difference um and then we get to chapter 14 fred will you share with us please uh 14 3 through 9 while he was in bethany reclining at the table in the home of a man known as simon the leper <clears throat> a woman came with an alabaster jar of very expensive perfume made of pure nard. She broke the jar and poured the perfume on, the he on his head. Some of those present were saying indignantly to one another, why this waste of perfume? It could have been sold for more than a year's wages and the money given to the poor, and they rebuked her sh harshly. Leave her alone, Jesus said. Why are you bothering her? She has done a beautiful thing to me, the poor you will always have with you, and you can help them anytime, anytime you want, but you will not always have me. She did what she could. She poured perfume on my body beforehand to prepare for my burial. Burial. I tell you the truth. Wherever the gospel is preached throughout the world, what she has done with done will also be told in memory of her and that's it so what's what does this tell us about the gospel anytime that this message remember we said it's a message that needs proclaimed to the whole world 
anytime the gospel is preached, people are going to talk about what this woman did and what what does Jesus say this woman did for him? Prepared him for burial. Yeah, she prepared him to die. So anytime the gospel <laughs> is proclaimed, we are going to talk about this woman who prepared Jesus to die. The good news, whatever else the gospel is, the gospel needs to include Jesus dying. Um, and we are going to spend a lot of time with that uh, in a couple weeks. But I, I think for me, the common thread with all these things is gospel for Mark is the power of Jesus himself. It is Jesus taking action. It is the whole story of Jesus, of what he did. It is God's kingdom arriving in Jesus. It is Jesus' death. It is Jesus offering the invitation to follow. It is Jesus sending us to proclaim the message. It is always including Jesus' death. So I think gospel for Mark, he looks at it from many different ways, but it is the power of Jesus himself that is present wherever people announce what God is doing through Jesus. So there is power in telling the story. And like I said, we're going to spend a little time with kind of why he writes the way he does. It's not just that he wants to communicate information. He wants to invite people into the story. So the reason that the gospel is the power of Jesus himself is it's not just telling a story for the sake of telling a story. It's telling a story for the purpose of continuing the story. And that's why that power continues to be active. Um, let me say one other thing and then let me stop and, and uh, collect questions there. Um, so this is what I think gospel means when Mark uses it. What does gospel mean when we use it? A uh, suggestion from uh, commentator Lamar Williamson. Gospel can be a genre, a theological message, or a canonical writing with the authority of the church. Mark is all three. Uh, I would agree with that assessment. It is a type of book that tells the story of Jesus and his ministry. Uh, and not doing it objectively. It does it in a way in order to build up faith. Gospel is a theological message. And remember, it is that power of Jesus, um, that power that's present wherever people talk about what God is doing through Jesus. And it is one of these four books that the church has said, yes, this book has authority because it is a faithful account of Jesus' life. Let me stop there and collect questions. Uh, what, what are we thinking about with the term gospel now? People can just go ahead and unmute and shout out. What was that last thing you said about um, the suggestion was the gospel can be a genre, a theological message, or a what? A canonical like a writing. Collect oh, a canonical writing. Okay. Yes. yes, one that is officially approved uh, by the church as an authoritative account of Jesus' life. But don't we call the Gospel of Thomas a, a, a gospel and it's non-canonical? Yes, because gospel could be any of these three things. It, it fits into the genre of gospel. It is a story of Jesus' life told to make a theological point. Um, so while it is not accepted as a canonical book, it is considered a gospel because it's that, that type of book. Does that make sense? It does. So we okay. don't have to have all three present. We just have to have one of the three present. Correct. We just have to have one of the three present. Mark happens to be all three. He, fit, he hits the trifecta. <laughs> Any other questions? 
things we want to spend a little more time with at this point? What, what is actually meant by a canonical? What does that word mean? Canon um, the canon is the official, uh, official list of what is uh, considered authoritative. Uh, it comes from a Greek word that means a measuring stick. Um, so canonical means it is officially um, accepted by the, the church as an authoritative work. Um, so everything that is printed in your Bible is canonical. There are um, what they call the apocryphal books, or some people call them deuterocanonical. It's like the, the second group. They're like the second string. Uh, if you have a study Bible, you may have some of those in the middle. They're usually between the Old Testament and the New Testament. The Catholic Church accepts them as, uh, as canonical. Most other churches do not. Um, so canonical refers to it as... Uh, officially recognized as being authoritative by the church. Other questions? So Mark says what he is, and then he goes through and he uses that word again and again and again. And each time, like I said, I think he is referring to gospel is... Jesus ability to make something happen it is it is Jesus power um, were we to be reading Mark's gospel closer to the time when it was written we might see the title and say okay the gospel of of Jesus Christ but it might have been it might have started out more as a bibliography um, we usually think of a bibliography as it is an account of a person's life. Like it tells you who the person is, what shaped the person's views and actions, uh, what great things the person did. But ancient autobiographies were different, just like ancient history was different. Um, a biography in antiquity was you know, talking about the person's life, but there were certain events in the person's life that were chosen and used um, to reveal the character of the person with the hope of getting the reader to be like this great person. Um, so a lot of your more well-respected ancient biographies, it wasn't so much, hey, here's the story of, of the life of Tom. And we want you to know what a great guy Tom was. No, it was more, here's the story of the life of Tom. Here's some of the great things he did. Wouldn't it be great if you could be like Tom? So that, that maybe makes some sense too, if we're thinking about what kind of book is Mark. He's not a biography in the sense that... Um, it's just a story of who he is and what he does. Because, I mean, if, if all we had to go on was Mark, Jesus is a guy who showed up one day when John the Baptist was out baptizing. A biographer would, you know, try and pin down, hey, this is where the guy was born. This is who his family was. Um, this is what shaped him growing up. Mark doesn't do any of those things. Um, but Mark does present specific things in the life of Jesus with the hope of provoking a response from us. So I don't know if I'm 100% sold on reading it as being like a biography, but I think there's some, some elements to it. And as we've said before, understanding kind of what type of book it is, is important. Um, and the example, example I like to give is that um, Genesis is not a science book. If you try to read it as a science book, you are going to end up with some stuff that is um, extremely difficult to reconcile with other things that we recognize as science. Um, and that is by no means a slam on Genesis. I think it is one of the most fascinating 
uh, books of the Bible that really wrestles with faith in God. Um, but it's not there to answer questions of, you know, how exactly did this thing happen? It's more interested in why would God do that? Or, you know, how did things end up like this? Um, so yeah, what type of book something is matters to, to how we interpret it. Uh, let me stop there. Other questions? I have a question. Yes. Uh, who was Mark writing to? Was this the, the Jews or the Gentiles or whoever would listen at the time or? That is a mighty good question. Um, we don't see any of the kind of telltale signs that you have in, uh, in Matthew or in John that there's, you know, kind of conflict within Judaism and he's trying to speak to that. We don't have any of the telltale signs like we have in Luke that he is really, really trying to get out there and talk to um, people who are outside of Israel. I think Mark is, um, Mark is trying to speak, this is my conjecture. Mark is trying to speak to people who have heard of this Jesus guy and kind of want to know who he is, what he's about, and if he is worth, you know, kind of worth their time. I think Mark is written, uh, he, he is written for the purpose of, of evangelism. He's maybe not people's first introduction to Jesus, but he is hoping to get people involved with Jesus. Kim, I, I was just, I was just going to say something that I, I, have in my Bible, it says that um, it suggests that it was written for a community of Christians situated within the Roman Empire, but outside of Palestine. Do you have the Lutheran Study Bible by any chance? I do. <laughs> um, so, um, yeah, like I said uh, earlier, we, we don't have, Mark doesn't give us a ton to go on uh, in terms of a particular audience. I think he's just trying to reach anybody he can. Um, the question came up this morning, uh, you know, what language was Mark written in? Uh, like the rest of the New Testament, he was written in Greek. Mark is written in extremely basic Greek. Um, some of it you could arguably look at, arguably look at and say, this is actually wrong. Um, was and you know could that have been he's trying to use very simple writing so a lot of people can can read it or maybe maybe greek was not his first language but he said i want the most people to be able to read this so even though you know i grew up speaking you know aramaic or coptic or whatever it was i'm going to write in greek because i know a lot of people know how to read that um so even the the way it's written seems to be uh, doesn't doesn't give us a ton of information about the audience, but maybe it was trying to have have broad appeal. That is my that is my conjecture. Um, other questions. Can I have an observation? Yes. Mark always seems to be to have gloves on. He's his Jesus is fighting Satan and demons, and his and his Jesus is fighting the ignorance of his disciples. Yeah, Mark's Mark's Jesus is um, he's uh, belligerent. Yes, he's belligerent Jesus. Um, the disciples are, are not cast in that great of a light. Um, mm -hmm. and, and he doesn't really have time. He, Mark's Jesus and John's Jesus, they, they look at very different aspects of, of how Jesus worked. Mark's Jesus doesn't have time to sit down and chat real often. In John... 
John had access to tradition, tradition that said, you know, Jesus really liked to talk. Uh, Matthew as well. Um, and again, that might have had something to do with the material. <laughs> to. It probably had something to do with the point Mark was trying to make about who Jesus was. Um, but yeah, Mark's Jesus, uh, he's just off to the next thing again and again and again. Um, he does not sit still. And no, he is not afraid to, to mix it up with people. So, um, let me stop here and, and ask what people would like to do. We could keep going a little uh, farther tonight. Uh, we could start asking, you know, why does Mark write the book? Uh, and we could dive into that. We could bring our time uh, to a close tonight. That would kind of keep us close to what we did this morning. Um, the group in the morning, uh, we're, we're a little more chatty Cathy, so that slowed us down a little bit. But I am fine with either. If people would like to uh, press on tonight, or if people want to pick up with, um, with our next section uh, next week. Uh, do people have strong feelings one way or another? No, whatever you want. Next week. Boy. I love when people say that. Um, is, is that uh, agreeable to folks? Yeah, that's fine. Uh -huh. And we've, yes. I've, I've done a lot of talking tonight. I've thrown a lot of stuff at you. So maybe having some time to let that digest would be okay. Um, and, and Lindsay, you can ask any of the other people. It's usually not quite this much of me talking. So will, will, will somebody say amen? Amen. Amen. <laughs> Uh, so yeah we will pick up next week with um kind of why does mark write his book and how how does that impact the way he tells the story and we will spend quite a bit more time with our bibles next week um but let me let me ask one more time any other questions on mark observations uh kind of with where we uh where we have been so far i will say i just asked for questions and then i kept talking let me stop and make sure there's nothing else people are wondering about. You know, Pastor, I always struggle with whether I should read ahead or if I should just kind of absorb as we go. Any, any thoughts? Read ahead, like read more of the handout or read more of your, your scripture? Read more of the scripture. Oh, always read more scripture. By okay. all means, absolutely, absolutely. If you want to go ahead and, and read ahead in the, the handout, that's fine. But I, I designed these sessions to be kind of, we come together, we do them, and I don't want to, uh, I don't want to give you homework between them uh, real often. So if you, if you want to kind of go through and, and look ahead and work ahead a little bit, um, I absolutely will not tell you that's a bad idea, but um, you know, I think there's also value to going through it together. But if you feel moved to read a little bit more of Mark's gospel uh, between now and next week, by all means, do that. And my hope is that when you do go ahead and read the gospel or when you hear it throughout uh, this church year to come, that you'll hear it and you'll go, wait a minute. Yes, that makes sense. You know, I, I know why he's doing it. It's because you know, gospel is the power of Jesus. So when he says, you know, this thing about the gospel, he's not talking about the book itself. He's talking about what Jesus does. So um, by all means, go ahead, read, read your Bible as much as you feel like you want to read it. I would be I a bad a clergy person if I told you not to read your Bible more. I have such a pastor thing to say. <laughs> I have a question for you, pastor. Yes. You said Mark is going to be our gospel of this church year. Well, our church year starts now. So yep. how is Mark going to be incorporated into our Christmas or does it begin in our 2021 year? Um, it is It is the, the primary gospel. It is not the only one. Uh, Christmas is always Luke. Um, so we will actually hear from... We'll actually hear from John the next two Sundays. 
part of what we're what we're going to find is that there's a lot of stuff that is in the other gospels that is not in mark so the people who put the lectionary together will sometimes cherry pick a little bit um this is the year that um so in the summer of 2021 we get the bread of life series where they take john chapter six and break it up over five or six weeks um and every week is jesus talking about i am the bread of life and he says something about that and then he says again i'm the bread of life and he says something else um so we won't hear from Mark every single week, but the vast majority of the year, we will be hearing from Mark. We'll hear from John a lot in the season of Easter, and then we'll hear from John again a little bit over the summer. But it is, it is our primary uh, source for this year. So um, this past Sunday, we started with Mark chapter 13. Uh, man, the apocalypse. The, the return of the Son of Man. And then this coming Sunday is actually chapter 1. Uh, so we start back at the beginning with the ministry of John the Baptist. Does that does that answer your question? Yes. Okay, good, 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 good. So I will say that Mark is probably the gospel I find the most uh, interesting. It is the gospel that I really, um, I think, um, speaks the most clearly about who Jesus is. And in the, the weeks to come, we're going to get into, I think, is um, really revolutionary in how he understands Jesus. And um, Matthew and Luke pick up on that um, and, and amplify it, but Mark seems to be the first one to have connected this particular set of dots, which, um, which we take for granted, but was pretty, pretty amazing that somebody picked up on that. So um, I'm, I'm excited to be studying Mark with you. I, I always love getting together and studying. We always uh, learn lots of things. I learn a lot uh, studying with you, um, but I'm really excited to be studying Mark. So, um, so there. Um, so unless there are any more uh, questions or, or things we want to make sure we're understanding, um, we can go ahead and, and conclude our time together tonight praying the Lord's Prayer. Well, let us pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our give us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us, not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. Thy kingdom and the power of our power forever and ever. Amen. Thank you, everyone, for being here. Thank you for your time. Thank you for your engagement. And, uh, we will see everybody again soon. All right. Thank you. Good night. Thank you, Pastor. Thank you, Thank you everybody. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.